These records contain sound waves in their grooves, and with a simple machine called a phonograph, the sound embedded in them can be heard. It's easy to understand how the phonograph makes sound from the groove. Click here for our videos explaining the two biggest inventions. But with this invention, the sound seems to come from nowhere. This is of course a radio, and it's able to literally take sound from thin air. Radio isn't magic sound, though. The principles behind it are pretty simple, and that's what we'll be talking about today. I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. Radio is special because its invention brought about the birth of the electronics industry. We're not going to be spending too much time on the discovery of radio since we're mainly concerned with sound reproducing technologies. These are the big ticket items in today's discussion. They're called vacuum tubes and are responsible for making this radio work. So a little theory. I promise I'll keep it light. Radio is, to put it simply, very specific electromagnetic waves sent in modulated patterns. If you send electricity through a wire, it will emit some electromagnetic energy. Send electricity through it at a high frequency, and this energy will travel pretty far. We found this out a long time before radio was invented, and for a while it mystified us. We called this energy Hertzian waves for Heinrich Rudolf Hertz's discovery of them, and no one knew quite what to do with them. Many people thought we could use them for communication, but no one yet followed through. There was also a bit of confusion as to who actually discovered this principle. Many phenomena involving electromagnetic waves were encountered and explained prior to Hertz's experiments, but when scientists showed their discoveries to their peers, they were often told this was a result of induction, not electromagnetism. So people knew this was going on, but they weren't yet able to attribute it to the right thing. Fast forwarding and glazing over many incremental discoveries, sorry, time constraints, we get to Guglielmo Marconi's idea. He wanted to take these Hertzian waves and create a commercial communication system with them. And he did. Wireless telegraphy was born, allowing people to communicate without wires. But telegraphy is not sound. It was just a way of sending encoded text. Brazilian priest Roberto Landel de Moura sent the first sound transmission, one of the human voice, in 1900. The first transmission of modern amplitude modulated radio occurred on Christmas Eve 1906 from Ocean Bluff, Brant Rock, Massachusetts. Marconi kept on board, take a lesson Edison, and opened a radio factory in 1912. So how do these work? We'll start with a very basic radio. This is a very old crystal radio set. I'm not even sure of what year it's from. It's called a crystal radio because it works using this, a crystal made of galena. Why do we need this crystal? Well, it's a semiconductor. It conducts electricity better in one direction than the other. Without it, we wouldn't be able to hear any sound. Why? Okay, a little more theory. AM radio, which we still use today, uses a constant frequency signal and an amplitude that varies. The signal is many times past the limit of human hearing in its frequency. They're sent today at between 540 and 1700 kilohertz. That's at least 550,000 hertz. Human hearing can't detect anything above a mere 20,000 hertz, so this is way above the limit of our hearing. But it's not the signal itself that we want to hear. It's the modulation built into the signal. This is what a sound wave being broadcasted with amplitude modulation looks like. Its amplitude varies with the shape of the sound wave, and that's why it's called amplitude modulation. See, the sound is modulated into the signal by altering the signal strength or amplitude. If we want to hear it, well, we don't care about all this high frequency mumbo jumbo, we just want this. We need to smooth out these high frequency signals to get the sound we want. That's easy work, but the more challenging thing lies in making the signal possible to hear. See, we want to hear this sound wave. If we simply average the signal out, well, this is the result we'll get. Nothing. That's because for each time the signal goes high, there's a deep pit following it on the next cycle, so they average to zero. We need some way to ignore the bottom half of the signal, and that's what the Galena crystal does. Because it lets electricity through it in one direction better than the other, the bottom half of the signal will be greatly reduced, and we'll end up with a measurable signal. This component was called the detector, since it allowed for these radio waves to actually be detected. Without it, the signal would cancel itself out. Now if we send this detected signal to an earpiece, we can finally hear the sound. You may have noticed that we haven't talked about these vacuum tubes yet. Crystal radios worked, but not well. They were unreliable, finicky, weren't sensitive, and they could only be used with headphones. We needed a way to pick up radio better, and we also needed to figure out a way to make them louder so others could hear. Lee DeForest got the ball rolling using a vacuum tube. Funny story, Thomas Edison actually rediscovered the principle that made vacuum tubes so useful for radio. Others had noticed it before, but his rediscovery of it brought it into the limelight. In his experiments with light bulbs, he discovered that electrons would flow from the bulb's filament in only one direction. This phenomenon was dubbed the Edison effect, but he hadn't a clue what to do with it. The Edison effect is what we now call thermionic emission. 
He discovered it when trying to figure out why the glass in his light bulbs would blacken unevenly with use. In Edison's experiments, he placed a third electrode next to the filament in his light bulbs to try and find out what was going on. He found that the current was flowing from the filament to the electrode, but only if the electrode was positively charged. The electron hadn't been discovered yet, so there was no way Edison could possibly have known the real cause, but we do. What's going on with thermionic emission is the filament is sputtering electrons off from it because it's hot. Since electrons are negatively charged, they will flow towards a positively charged electrode, but not a negatively charged one. If you collect these electrons into a current, you'll find that they only go in one direction. A man named John Ambrose Fleming used this principle to make the first diodes. These are the simplest vacuum tubes. A heated cathode sputters electrons into an evacuated envelope, and a positively charged anode collects these electrons, and thus we get a current. Because of the one-way nature of thermionic emission, any alternating current, such as a radio wave, would be rectified into a direct current signal when sent to the diode. These vacuum tubes made excellent radio detectors. They did the same thing as the Galena crystal, but they were electronic and much more reliable. So we've solved the reliability issue, but the signal we get is still too weak to do anything but drive headphones. We need a way to amplify this signal in order to drive a loudspeaker, back to Lee Forest. He took the diode and threw in a third element. The resulting tube, which he called the audion tube, was a triode. DeForest's idea was to find a way to control the flow of electrons from cathode to anode. You could send a fairly large current through one of these already existing diodes, but that didn't mean anything if you couldn't control it. DeForest added a control grid between the anode and cathode. If a negative voltage was applied to this control grid, electrons would be prevented from flowing between the cathode and anode. In essence, by putting a voltage on the grid, you could turn off the flow of electrons. This is why many Commonwealth countries call these valves. They function as literal valves for electrons. The control grid is able to directly affect the current traveling through the tube. It's just like turning a faucet on and off. Here's a picture of one of the first audion tubes. The four wires at the base originally connected to a filament. It's since burned out, but this filament would sputter electrons off its surface. The plate at the top was positively charged, so it would attract and collect these electrons. But they had to go through the control grid first. That's the wavy thing here. If a negative voltage was applied to the grid, the electrons couldn't get through. So by placing a voltage on the control grid, you can switch the current flow through the tube off. This was an incredibly important discovery. You needed only a very small voltage on the grid to control electron flow. This meant that even the puny little signals being picked up by radios could be used to control these triodes. The result? An amplified signal. By placing the weak incoming signal on the control grid, the vacuum tube's strong electron flow between cathode and anode will be modulated exactly like that incoming signal. But since the tube has a lot of electrons flowing through it, the result from the tube is a much stronger signal. If you needed, you could send this signal through another triode and amplify it further. Eventually, you'd end up with a signal that's powerful enough to move one of these loudspeakers. Loudspeakers are what solve the headphone problem. As we've seen in our last videos, to make sound, we need a vibrating diaphragm. To make a lot of sound, we need a big diaphragm, and it needs to move a lot. That's where loudspeakers came in. These are, in essence, specialized solenoids that move a large diaphragm. Loudspeakers are constructed in a cone shape. The center of the cone is covered in a dust cap, and behind it is the voice coil. This is a coil of wire that is attached to the cone. It's positioned so that it rests inside a large magnet. The coil of wire makes a functional solenoid. See, if a positive voltage is applied, then the coil will move forward away from the magnet. The opposite current produced the opposite reaction, making the coil move towards the magnet. The cone that the voice coil is attached to can move in and out a great distance. See, it's floating in this position because of the rubber surround. The surround helps keep the voice coil centered and also seals the cone to the sides of the loudspeaker. That way, when the cone moves, it moves the greatest amount of air. To make sound with a loudspeaker, we just need to send a fluctuating current to it. That way, the cone will vibrate and will get noise. If the current quickly rises and falls, then the cone will also quickly move in and out. If the current we send through here is modulated from a sound source, then the speaker will make sound. This is just like the speaker in Bell's telephone, only it's larger and louder. And that is exactly why these are called loudspeakers. So radio works like this. A microphone in the studio picks up the vibrations from a performer's voice. Transmitting equipment takes the microphone signal and modulates it into a carrier wave at, say, 720 kilohertz. This signal is sent to a transmitting tower, and thus radio waves are sent far and wide. A radio receiver, like this one, listening to the station, will be tuned to 720 kilohertz. That is, its circuitry will be limited to only picking up 720 kilohertz signals. 
The modulated signal first goes through the radio's detector diode, which chops off the bottom half of the wave so it doesn't simply cancel itself out. This new signal is smoothed out by a component called a capacitor, and now we have an audible signal. This new signal, though, is too weak to do anything but drive very small headphones, and we want to drive this loudspeaker. We send the signal to the control grid of a triode. The loudspeaker is hooked up to the output of our triode, so the loudspeaker can get plenty of current. The triode modulates that current's strength based on the signal being applied to the control grid. The triode is now producing a current that matches our signal exactly, but it's much stronger, and the loudspeaker can now vibrate and produce loud sound for all to hear. Thanks for joining me on Technology Connections. I'll admit that radios in practice are a bit more complicated than what we've covered here. We'll be exploring what's called a superheterodyne radio in a separate video to get a more detailed look. But what's most important is the vacuum tube. The invention of the vacuum tube triode opened the floodgates for sound innovation. Next week on Technology Connections, we'll look at where vacuum tubes allowed us to go. Electrical sound recording.